All right, excellent. Well, thanks for inviting me to talk today. I was telling David um, earlier that normally I end up talking about psychiatry or brain development stuff. So it's really nice to be able to talk about, I think the in some ways more important and harder problems that we spend most of our time on. Uh, so, you know, I've got a bunch of content here. I don't care if I get through all the slides. It's a small group, so feel free to interrupt. I'd rather discuss than just, you know, uh, blizzard you with content. So uh, feel free to jump in at any point. I'm an informal person and happy to diverge at any moment. Um, so I'll be talking today about some of the methods and data resources we're working on for reproducible large-scale studies of the developing brain. Uh, and it, there we go. Uh, like the motivation for this research is my lab primarily focuses on studying brain development because I'm a psychiatrist and increasingly the dominant paradigm in psychiatry is that most psychiatric illnesses are developmental in origin. Uh, this comes from epidemiological studies, translational studies in, animal, in animals, humans. Um, and really the, the broad goal here is to understand how the brain develops normally uh, so we can understand how abnormal brain development is associated with risks of different sorts of mental illness. However, this is a really challenging problem because if you wanna understand normal brain development, which is then you have to have sampling at each age bin, much less abnormal brain development, which is probably extremely heterogeneous, and you also need sampling at each age bin, you're going to need very large data sets. And uh, how to work with these data sets in a reproducible way to actually advance science forward is one of the biggest challenges that we've been grappling with uh, over the past 10 years or so. And what I'll talk about today is scratching the surface. This is very much all uh, remains a work in progress and builds on the incredible contributions of the Reprenum group, David, Satra, JB, everyone here who, you know, we've been looking up to for years. Uh, so, uh, all right. Um, some of the challenges that we face with this research, uh, I'll briefly uh, review before focusing on the fourth one here, which is neuroinformatics. First challenge, large data. It takes a lot of data to define normal brain development, much less parts of extremely large biological heterogeneity. And so kind of assembling data resources is one of the main things we're focused on today. Once you have those data resources, we have a lot of collaborations with people who really are focused on new machine learning tools and statistical models for how to look at high dimensional data and find latent dimensions and subtypes, because clearly the DSM does not carve nature at its joints. And if we want to make progress, we're going to need to get to something that has more bi biological validity. I'm not going to talk much about the analytics to, uh, today. Um, one element of the analytics is how we find sensitive measures of individual difference. Uh, because as we're trying to aggregate these very large data resources, one potential risk is that we kind of dumb things down so much that we lose uh, validity in our search for getting big data. Um, so, and this applies to measures of both brain and behavior, if we're interested in brain behavior studies. A huge focus in the lab, which I'm not going to talk about today, is person-specific functional neuroanatomy and applying those to large data sets, like this work from Zaishu Kui that just recently came out. And more recently, uh, in turn, on the behavior end, moving to mobile-based phenomics uh, for kind of rich uh, characterization of behavior. So we're going away from like kind of standard checklists and interviews. But really what I'll be focused on is uh, today is neuroinformatics. In particular, efforts to reduce noise and control bias and facilitate reproducible neuroscience at scale. Really, I'll break this up into two main buckets and end with, uh, with kind of an promissory note or advertisement for some of the data resources we're working on. The first one will be some of our work on motion artifact and the second on some tools and software. Um, now, when we're talking about reproducibility, motion artifact, might, people might think that it's a little bit different, and it is. So if we kind of zoom out and talk about what the, reproduci the source of the reproducibility crisis, like the field is kind of honed in on several factors that, re re that reduce reproducibility in neuroimaging, small sample sizes, inadequate type one error correction, analytic flexibility without pre-registration, and really lack of infrastructure, so you just have human error. Um, this, these are all incredibly important and some of the tools that I'm gonna talk about in the second half of the talk address in particular the infrastructure issue. But I wanna start with something that is adjacent to the reproducibility crisis, but I think just as important, which is bias because motion artifact is reproducible, it's just wrong. Um, and so a lot of our work has been to try to understand how data quality affects our data because as we get to bigger and bigger data sets, we have 
a lot of power to look at development and statistical power to look at psychopathology, but we're also op opening ourselves up to being very, very sensitive to bias. And in our experience and many others, data quality has a much bigger effect on our images than the other things we care about, like development, much less psychopathology. So when we started this work in around 2010, <laughs> kind of two of the major uh, findings in functional connectivity for adolescent brain development were that long range connections strengthen and short range connections weaken. And that this is from a paper from my friend and collaborator, Damon Fair, and also that within module connectivity strengthens, whereas between module connectivity weakens. And this is uh, basically the brain's uh, functional networks become more defined. However, in 2010, that's right when I was like starting to get into studies of brain development, that I, around that same time, I also had twins. And it, you don't need to scan thousands of kids uh, to see that motion is going to be a major problem. You just have to like come to any of one with kids dinner table and see that their kids won't sit still. And we've been worried about this issue in psychiatric imaging for a while. And in getting into it, into looking at functional connectivity imaging and development, we were curious as to whether this is an issue. And I was surprised in, you know, 2012 that no one looked at this. And so, you know, it's an initial plot showing that motion was highly related to age between the age range we typically study between nine and 23. Um, but subsequently it's became clear that motion artifact isn't just an issue for studies of brain development. It's really an issue for like a, any study of individual difference. This is a, uh, a paper from Josh Siegel, Wash U, who showed that uh, basically any measure you can care about in the Human Connectome Project is related to in-scanner motion. Uh, and the effect sizes are often large, like body mass index or correlation of 0.6, for example. The uh, things like uh, cognitive testing around 0.2, um, and if we know that the effect sizes of things like psychopathology are less than that, and that uh, these measures are correlated, then it's a very high risk that if we don't control this artifact, we're not going to be studying what we're interested in. We're just going to be reporting an alias to data quality issues. So in some of the early work, we found contemporaneously with Kuna Van Dyke and Randy Buckner and Jonathan Power and Steve Peterson using independent methods and data sets that motion systematically biases estimates of functional connectivity. These are, this data is like, when you see a plot like this, this is so strong, it can like basically only be artifact. And the main effect in kind of standard pre-processing at that time is that if you're on the y-axis here, if you look at the correlation between motion and functional connectivity, nodes that are close together in the brain, as kids move more, they get more connectivity. And, mo as, uh, and uh, as kids move more locations that are far away from each other in the brain, you get less connectivity. And this was extremely informative because this is the exact opposite of kind of the canonical finding of how the brain develops in the first place. So we're like, right out of the gate, we knew we had a major problem. Subsequently to that, these kind of initial descriptions for around, and it's still going on, but it was very, very intense, like around like for like five years after that, I would get like a request for neuroimage to review a new denoising technique uh, around every week. And there was a huge amount of uphe upheaval in the field. It would pe papers were getting bogged down in review because people weren't sure what to do. And people wanted the uh, authors to denoise things like seven different ways to show things that they were right. And it, uh, this happened to us just like everyone else. Um, and so as to try to get a sense of how different denoising pipelines performed, Roscoe uh, Chidich, an awesome former data analyst in the lab, who's now Russ Poldrax, bioengineering uh, student, looked at 14 commonly used pipelines at the time and evaluated them on a couple different measures. And what he found was that among these 14 different pipelines, there's just a massive heterogeneity in how they perform. If one of the outcome measures you look at is just how many edges are related to motion after denoising. Like these are kind of some commonly used pipelines that we use, but people still use these in 2022. And instead of 1% of the edges being significantly related to motion, you might have like 80%. Um, so it's just a huge heterogeneity in pipeline performance. And this matters if you're studying the developing brain, because if you compare like kind of like a good pipeline uh, without a covariate versus like kind of an average pipeline without controlling for motion and as a covariate on the second level in regression, just mass univariate testing. If you look at the number of edges that survive correction in terms of the age effect, the developmental effect, you basically quintuple it. So your apparent age effect, if you don't control for motion very, very carefully, can be you know, five times bigger. That's not to say that, the, that like, there's not developmental effects there. There definitely are, even after bone for correction, when you're super, super conservative. 
But what of age effects remain varies. So this is like the initial finding of, okay, distance dependent age effects uh, is like how the brain uh, develops. So remember the canonical finding was long range connections strengthen and short range connect connections weaken. When we looked across four different scenarios, standard pre-processing uh, pre versus improved pre-processing with and without a statistical covariate for mean motion during the scan, you can see that this huge distance dependence gets less and less and less. There's still some there, it's significantly different, but it's massively inflated um, by uh, alias thin artifact. And uh, this uh, literally the same time using different methods in a different data set, Damon Fair and Mike Nolan showed the same thing. Um, now, if you go the other way for the other canonical finding, which was that uh, instead of distance dependence, that these network modules become more apparent as kids grow up, the subnetworks become more defined. As you control for motion, you actually see the opposite effect here, that th that, that effect becomes stronger. Um, and so this kind of suggests that we're not like, because you can imagine that you deno denoise your data so much, so, so much, there's like no signal left. So it's not related to motion, but it's not related to anything else either. Um, but here you can see that actually, if you do careful denoising and control for motion very carefully, you actually see this network segregation even more clearly um, as connections to strengthen with age and green become uh, more and more intramodular. We've seen this uh, to be true and not just in functional imaging data, but in structural imaging using tractography. Also, this is a work from a former grad student, Grant Baum. Uh, and this matters uh, because if you look at different denoising, if you look again, these 14 different deno denoising methods, um, again, the ones that tend to perform best uh, <coughs> actually uh, enhance your ability to see subnetworks. So motion has the effect of obscuring kind of the fundamental organization of the connector. So all of this initial work was on functional connectivity, but in our large scale studies, we collect usually five, six different image types, right? Uh, and we knew it was a major problem, that motion was a major problem here, but of course we started getting worried about all the rest of them too. Um, and other people got worried about them also. So we've kind of subsequently, along with other people in the field, systematically been marching across these other, other modalities to try to assess how bad is the problem and how can we control it. Um, I now incredibly impactful paper by Martin Reuter and Dylan Tisdall um, at Harvard showed that uh, in-scanner motion impacts cortical thickness measurements too. Uh, and this has a lot of implications for the developing brain and studies of autism, all sorts of things. Um, they measured this using like a very, very controlled circumstance uh, of like having people move in the scanner in combination with uh, epi navigators. However, most of the large data sets that we've acquired, like that we've acquired at Penn and other people acquired elsewhere, didn't have the navigators to actually quantify the motion like this Reuter paper. So we knew it was a problem, we just didn't know how to measure it. So going back, um, we looked at a bunch of different measures. Um, just having trouble advancing, there we go. Uh, we looked at a bunch of different measures uh, to try to uh, see whether we could get a quantitative measure of structural image quality without having to do manual rating. So we trained three raters to like a very high degree of inter-rater reliability and three rounds of training, and then um, had all three raters rate uh, around 2000 images um, for in a training testing and validation set, and then looked at different measures, including things like CNR, SNR, skewness, smoothness, things like that. And also the Euler number, which is a measure of topological complexity from the free server re reconstruction of the surface to see how they aligned with these manual ratings and whether we could get something good. What we found was that the Euler number actually is by far the best and has very, very good ROC curves for like kind of identifying terrible images uh, without, uh, I, I, that would be flagged by manual QC. Furthermore, it provides a dimensional uh, automatic quantification of image quality that you can include as a covariate in your model for the images that do pass quality. So here we're looking at the effect uh, on thickness, the association between Euler number and thickness across training, testing, and validation sets. It's extremely consistent. So this is a way to get a measure of image quality in your data that pass QA. Um, so if we're thinking of, across our different image modalities here, okay, we've talked about functional connectivity. We did some work on structural connectivity. Our lab does a lot of work in diffusion imaging also. And Graham Baum went and found that in-scanner motion has a huge impact on diffusion tractography, just like functional connectivity. Here, this is plotted by deterministic edge consistency, but we can see that just like 
uh, functional connectivity, motion has a predictable and biased effect on uh, uh, long range versus short range streamlines in, uh, that are reconstructed through tractography. Um, now, moving forward, there's with multi shell sequences, there's a lot of different derived measures we can pull out of the diffusion imaging data. Um, and what's interesting is, though, even most people use things like FA, fractal anisotropy. There's newer measures like uh, from uh, uh, multi-shell models and NADI models, like uh, from like like multi-shell models like uh, NADI or uh, uh, MAP MRI or uh, MAP OL MRI, the Laplacian, the Laplacian regularized version. And what we found is that some of these newer measures, like RTOP, that's the return to origin probability. Uh, or ICVF, which is the uh, intracellular volume fraction from a NADI model, these are more sensitive to age than something like FA. So they're more sensitive to developmental effects, but simultaneously less sensitive to motion. So we probably really shouldn't be using FA anymore. We should be using measures that are more sensitive to what we care about and less sensitive to the noise, which we know is in the data. Um, that was like kind of a brief overview of some of the work we've done on data quality. Uh, I know I tend to talk quickly though, so I'll pause for questions before I go on for uh, to tools and software. Comments, questions, arguments, asides, caveats. I guess one very quick one that uh, the, uh, I mean, the kind of the warning on the number of papers uh, is hard to, it's hard to know, you know, like you read the paper, you, there's an, an, a number of things that have not been corrected or like measure the expression movement and, uh, and, and what, how do you yourself read the paper where you don't see this and what, what kind of a, you know, how do you yeah. assess, you know, whether that's, uh, I mean, uh, I guess it's from the yeah, knowledge sure. of course, but, uh, well, how do we, how do we implement this practically, right? Uh, like, and so uh, people, because of this work, sometimes when I talk to people, like people think I'm going to be like a total fascist when it comes to like motion artifact and like be very dogmatic about, oh no, you have to use this particular pipeline or something like that. It's actually I don't believe that because that that suggests that we have a right answer, and I make no claims knowing the right answer. But I think there's several rules of thumb that we can all think are reasonable. First is. If you're looking at a study of individual, first, it'll vary by study design. So, but a lot of what we do are fundamentally studies of individual difference. Young kids versus old kids, sick people versus not sick people, right? And in that sort of study de design of individual and group differences, show me how motion or some other measure of data quality, like the Euler number for structural, is different between those groups or how it's associated, a scatter plot, <laughs> like start there. So that's one. Second thing is, in it, how is that measure of data quality related to your primary measure that you're going to be analyzing your model? Like, you know, like if it's modularity, show me the plot between motion and modularity. And then like, because usually things will be different between groups and usually they will be associated with your drive measure that you want to analyze. And that is an obvious mediation triangle. And I, uh, and it, like, and then so in, and then the next step is, okay, well, show me the results while co-varying for motion. Um, and it, if it's like, like, or like, usually that will be, that will, re, that will reassure me or like match it or use a low motion sample or something like that. I think that uh, that, that seems like standard of care. And compared to like 10 years ago, I think a lot more papers meet that um, because people have been so beat up over it in review in the past. Is that how you think about it, JB? Or? Yeah, no, I think uh, that, that's excellent. Uh, I'm just thinking about all the papers that don't do that and what, how do we, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, anyways. No, exactly. Yeah, no, I, think, uh, I think having those guidelines for like almost uh, any paper now is, uh, would be, uh, it's, it's almost like, you know, making sure that all the, you know, the publishing uh, venues and, uh, you know, uh, ad adopt those guidelines really, I think it's, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, it's, I think that like how to, how to assess literature retrospectively. I mean, you run into the same stuff with like, you know, better than me, like type one error. Like, I don't know, like <laughs> it's like, and the two things combined because the motion will inflate the results. So if you do poor motion control and poor type one error correction, then like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, but we can definitely do better going forward. All right. So I'll move on. If there's, if there's more questions, I'm happy to discuss now. Otherwise I'll talk about some of the tools we've been working on. 
All right. So kind of the tools can be broken up in three, three buckets, image processing, image curation, and image analysis. Uh, image processing kind of three main ones, XCP, the extensible connectivity pipelines, QSI prep, and ASL prep. Um, and this really started with this benchmarking study. So when Roscoe was doing, implementing all these pipelines for this benchmarking study, he effectively built a modular software package. And like, we realized it was he was building like, oh, we should use this for processing all of our data, um, not just for this one benchmarking study. And so he built um, what came to be the extensible connectivity pipelines or XCP. And he originally, we originally envisioned it as a kind of a nose to tail pre-processing solution for studies of functional connectivity going from pre-processing and like all the co-registration and running the confound model and re making reports and everything else. However, around that same time, bids was really taking off and you guys know more about bids than I do, so I won't belabor it, but bids is like absolutely critical for describing and understanding your data. And critically, it allows for bids apps, which automatically read, read metadata to apply for pre-processing. And kind of the real killer bids app that came out around the same time as we were working on XCP was fMRI prop. And in the end, I don't care whether the software we use is built by our lab or someone else's. I just want it to be good and work. And it was clear to me that fMRI prop was better than what we were working on. However, it only took like that first half of the uh, of the processing pipeline. It didn't run confront regression or do some other performance assessments or derivative creation that XCP did. So we completely refactored XCP to be in uh, a post-processing module that works by obligate with uh, output of fMRI prep. And this has seen wide adoption. Uh, it's been downloaded like 6,000 times and we get around a quarter million successful executions uh, a quarter. Um, Aziz and Mbimpe, our uh, senior data engineer who is now at Left for Industry. I uh, did most of the work on this. Um, and kind of working on this is uh, with XCP, we developed this workflow, which you guys have been using for years, um, which is open and test-driven development. All the codes open on GitHub, incorporate CI tests throughout, and then automatically when the tests are passed, build a new container so we can deploy it elsewhere. Um, and this is the workflow where we use for all of our software development now uh, and including the current ongoing refactor of XCP, which we're doing in collaboration with Damien Fair uh, and his team at University of Minnesota, uh, building on tools like Nipipe. Uh, thank you, Satra, uh, because the amount of technical debt in the original, in the original version of XCP was very substantial. Uh, so re this refactor has been long overdue. Uh, and also we're adding additional functionality, including uh, being, in, being able to ingress not just from fMRI prop, but also at HCP data structures, the legacy DCAN pipelines, and importantly for this big HBCD study coming up, Nye Babies, which is the basically fMRI prep version for babies. Um, it, it also includes surface processing, expanded visual reports, and improved uh, uh, scrubbing, regression, and filtering. Um, and so we're excited about this and hope that uh, kind of we can get some substantial, you know, uh, buy that we get enough momentum that people will. Uh, you know, helps to maintain it. Uh, one of the challenges that you guys know better than me is made, made, building the software is one thing, but maintaining it is a whole nother story. Um, so just like I was talking about for QA though, we spent all this work on uh, pre-processing of functional Im imaging data, but what about all of our other image modalities? We want something like fMRI prep for all the other images we acquire as part of these large studies of the developing brain. Um, and uh, the first one we started with was diffusion imaging. Um, at that time, and there really wasn't anything like fMRI prep for DWI. Uh, there wasn't like an, a bids app that really performed well. So uh, Matt Cieslak, a senior scientist in my lab who leads the neuroinformatics team and has driven like a really substantial amount of this work and led the, these efforts, um, developed QSI prep. Uh, like fMRI prep, it's a bids app that auto configures to nearly all DMRI data. Because of the many different acquisition schemes of uh, diffusion imaging, this was a real challenge. Um, we benchmarked it, benchmarked it uh, compared to a bunch of custom pipelines, as I'll show you in the next slide. This is you know, a bunch of widespread adoption since it came out. It was published in Nature Methods last year, but it's been out pre-release for a while. Um, and it, uh, QSI prep includes both pre-processing and then a bunch of uh, uh, reconstruction workflows that are modular. And what's nice is we actually have seen people adding to these uh, reconstruction workflows. Like Ariel Rokum's team just added 
Pi FQ to this. So it's, uh, it's really gratifying to see people had features. Um, when Matt benchmarked this uh, as part of the initial study, we compared it to, uh, across a couple different uh, schemes and we compared it to the custom pipeline that the authors of uh, each study used uh, on both image smoothness and image quality, which was quantified as the DWI neighborhood correlation, which is a measure that Frank Yeah at Pittsburgh developed to look at basically how similar uh, locations nearby in QSpace are because they're, they're, they, the FOD should be similar. And we found that in general QSI prep uh, blurred the data less, so the data was less smooth and preserved more anatomic detail and had similar, if not slightly higher, uh, image quality across all these different sequences when compared to uh, kind of the custom pipeline that was developed for that sequence versus the QSI prep pipeline that was automatically configured. Um, as a uh, following, uh, so again, what the, the question was, okay, so now we have pipelines for fMRI and diffusion imaging, but what about ASL? And ASL is something that is uh, a particular focus here at Penn because it was developed in, at Penn in 1992 by John Detter and David Alsop. Uh, there's a lot of uh, expertise and kind of focus on ASL development at Penn, but there hadn't been a bid zap for it. Uh, <coughs> and so uh, Aziz and Mbimpe, uh, I created ASL Prep in collaboration with John Detry's team, uh, Russ Poldrak, Oscar Esteban, many others. Uh, and it really builds on the same workflow as fMRI prep and QSI prep and configures to handle almost all ASL data. Um, ASL is a very, very heterogeneous uh, modality. So this was also quite a challenge um, and it uses a combination of tools to try to maximize quality. It's fully containerized and highly reproducible. Um, and we, in the benchmarking, Aziz applied it to uh, 3,000 samples from five different data sets that have different sorts of ASL acquisition and really show that you get this incredibly consistent expected nonlinear decline of cerebral blood flow in gray matter across the cortex over the lifespan. So blood flow declines in childhood and early adulthood, flattens out in middle age, and then it starts to really decline in, six, in your 60s as, you, as aging progresses. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that is the, the main tools we want to work on image processing. But, you know, the, the deeper you get into the reproducibility chain, you realize that the processing containers aren't everything. There's the stuff on either side of it. There's the image curation on one end, and then there's image analysis on the other. And so we've been trying to broaden the analysis, looking at reproducible techniques on either side of that, on the analytic chain. And I want to talk about two uh, tools for image curation briefly one of which uh, is a bit custom and may not see wide use outside of a specific platform, and the other which I'm very excited about and I think could be widely used. The first one is called Foodiconf. It was developed by Tanasha Tapera, who's a senior data analyst in the group. He's going to grad school in Boston at Boston University in uh, computer science and informatics next. Um, and this addresses kind of some of the challenges of the Flywheel platform, which is how is used at Penn for getting images off the scanner and their functionality, the Flywheel functionality for getting data into bids um, isn't, it doesn't exactly match their glossy brochure. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, Tinashe built a, uh, a Python package for, uh, assisting get it, getting data into bids in a reproduci reproducible fa fashion within the Flywheel platform. Um, we use this and a lot of people at Penn use this, uh, I, for bid curation within Flywheel. However, uh, for these very large scale data resources, we don't use Flywheel. We only use Flywheel for our prospective studies where we're actually scanning the kids here. For these big data aggregation studies, we're ingesting large data, data resources from collaborators and their internet or other things, and we wanna do bids curation. And this is really challenging when you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of images, because um, typically deciding what whether you're like have your data appropriately curated in bids, it's off, like typically a manual process that's not tracked or at all reproducible. And furthermore, the software in the bids ecosystem is really optimized for small fMRI studies. And if as you get to try to run the validator on thousands of uh, participants in a study, it'll often fail or produce un like kind of unusable warnings. And also, pi bids can take a long time as you get to very large data sets. So, and perhaps kind of most concerningly, um, be, like though I love bid zaps as much as anyone, because they automatically configure to read the metadata in your JSON, 
you know, they can be run successfully, but still be wrong if the metadata is wrong. Um, and so how do we know that the metadata is right and track it in a reproducible way? Um, and for this uh, software that's now, uh, it's out and it's under review, uh, NeuroImage is on BioArchive, uh, a package developed by Sidney Kovitz and really conceptualized by Matt Sieslak. It's called Qubids, or, uh, which stands for Curation of Bids. And it's a sanity pre preserving workflow in Python package for checking and fixing bids data sets. Um, it really allows you to see the heterogeneity in the metadata in your data set in a very, very systematic way, and then alter it or fix it in a fully reproducible way because it incorporates data lad at every step. If you want, you should use it though. Um, and so basically, a lot, and what's crazy about Qubits is I've been working on like, let's say one large scale data set that I filled off in a developmental cohort, a study we collected at Penn and it's like 1600 kids. I've been working on that data for 10 years and I really didn't know what was in there really until we'd use Qubits. And so, and when you start to work on even bigger data sets like Healthy Brain Network or ABCD, the amount of heterogeneity and the amount of errors in the metadata is pretty wild. Um, and so we're really excited about Qubits because it allows us to uh, fix things in a reproducible way and track it. So we can really go back to see where we change things. And because if, if we can't, if, if that step's not reproducible, it doesn't matter how whether I'm using containers later, we've lost the reproducibility at some point in the chain. So kind of what I'm describing here is, uh, is our current workflow, which if we collect the data here, we use Foodicom uh, curate it to bids and within Flywheel get it onto the file system, check it into data lads, into data lad, use qubits to look at the heterogeneity in the data and fix and uh, do uh, fully re reproducible curation and then run, run multimodal data through the different containers, whether it's QSI prep and QSR recon, ASL prep or fMR prep and XEP. Then once we have derived reproducible derivatives to analyze, we move on to this <laughs> under specified purple box called analysis. Um, and I'll close by saying, talking about one uh, software package that we're uh, working on right now, which uh, is not that sexy, but I think could be quite useful called model array. Um, this is developed by Chen Ning Zhao, a really fantastic bioengineering student in the lab. And this addresses kind of the broader challenge of mass univariate data analysis with fMRI data, with, uh, with uh, high dimensional imaging data of any modality, whether it's voxel-wise data, structural, ASL, doesn't matter, pixel-wise data for, dif for diffusion imaging, surface uh, vertex data. You know, even though, you know, multivariate models have a huge number of advantages, mass univariate analysis of imaging data remains kind of a standard workhorse. However, there's uh, a bunch of challenges, uh, which is that, um, uh, here, I'm going to skip the slide, actually. Uh, okay, which is that um, first, we might want to run different uh, models of our uh, mass univariate data. We might now want to just run a, non uh, a linear model, like in a GLM. We might want to look at nonlinear models, because this is particularly important for studies of brain development. Um, we know nonlinearity is kind of the rule, not the exception when the developing brain. Furthermore, a major challenge in mass univariate analyses is that as studies get big, the memory usage required with standard tools can get very large. So this is only going up to 900 subjects. We can see this like linear scaling of the amount of memory required. And so when people are analyzing these large scale data resources, oftentimes in papers, you'll see them reporting like kind of downsampled data, not because it was scientifically like kind of the, what they wanted to do, it's just because it was easier. Um, and so really the goal here of model array was to be able to allow for nonlinear modeling uh, that's memory efficient and critically extend to many statistical models and have standard output naming across different imaging modalities or models uh, using our syntax and our output standards that our collaborators in statistics can understand easily. Um, and so, and we want it to be generalizable to many data types. However, we started uh, with pixels because the uh, current um, uh, functionality for analyzing pixel data is pretty limited to uh, the GLM implemented in MR tricks. Uh, for those of you who haven't worked a lot with diffusion data, pixels are a way to look at the crossing fiber pro to kind of address the crossing fiber problem where you have multiple fiber bundles within a given voxel. Pixels allow you to measure things like fiber density or fiber cross-section within fiber populations that are at in the same voxel. 
Um, right now, there's really not, there's only one tool available to do pixel based analyses, and it doesn't easily allow for things like nonlinearities in development. And it has these same linear me memory requirements, which can make it hard to use in large data. So, I, I, to address this, um, I, Chen Ying I developed a model array, which uh, the companion converter, which uh, can fixel, uh, which basically leverages the H5 data, data format uh, to get kind of uh, fixel images into uh, H5, and then uh, use the, use the, uh, our functionality of delayed array to analyze the data in blocks uh, to, for memory efficiency, then it gets written out back to the converter of Confixel and you can view it in whatever software you want. But this, um, I, the model fitting part is data general. And we, though we're focused on Fixels right now, we are, we are working on Convoxel and Consifty so we can have converters for each image type. And that way we can use the same models with the same output format and the same memory efficiency regardless of the data type. Um, and if you, in benchmarking studies, if we compared uh, across a sample of from 30 to 938 kids in the PNC data, uh, the memory usage of model array versus MR tricks, uh, with, despite the fact that there's reasonably similar runtime, you can see that because we're working on the data blockwise, model array is basically memory invariant across the size of the sample. This makes it much easier to use uh, in large data sets comparing to, com compared to when you need to get very large samples. Furthermore, the fact that we can uh, have the statistical flexibility uh, of using the extensibility in R, we can capture nonlinear effects by fitting things like general ad generalized additive models rather than just a simple linear model. And you can see that if you look at something like a uh, fixed measure like FDC, that's the fiber diameter cross section, you have this very, very clear nonlinear developmental pattern. All right, I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to end by just uh, mentioning a data resource that has been really driven the development of most of these tools, which is called the Reproducible Brain Charts Initiative that I lead together with Mike Millam. Um, and as part of this, we're trying to get a lot of the larger studies, largest cross-sectional studies of brain development, um, including the PNC, which is study here at Penn, Mike's NK Rockland sample and Healthy Brain Network sample, um, Xinyan Zhou's Chinese Color Nest Project, the Brazilian High Risk Cohort from Giovanni Saloum, the Human Connection Project Development and the Ping study. <coughs> um, uh, and try to get them all curated the same way, processed the same way, the same containers, all reproducible code, tracked in data lad, um, and open on the internet for everyone to use. So no one has to do the really painful work of curating, processing, and queuing this data over and over again, and rebuild that, uh, recreate that wheel. Um, and they can just use the data and run faster. So we're excited about this. It's our goal to get this uh, on Indie as a data release uh, within this year. Um, it's a push, but uh, I think we've done a lot of the hard parts on curation and building the software we needed to curate the data. Um, but we're really excited about it and uh, hope people use the data. So I will uh, end there because I think I'm uh, getting to be out of time uh, and save time for questions. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks so much. That was really great. Um, a whirlwind of things to, to consider. Uh, just because it's the last thing you presented, uh, some of those data sets you were mentioning in the, uh, the growth charts uh, project have differing sort of access criteria uh, in terms of uh, using them. Can you say a little bit about how you could imagine you know, managing that for the end user who you know, may have to get yeah. access via different routes? Yeah, no, the DOAs are tough for some of them. So I, I'm not sure if you noticed there's a there, there's a star next to the ping and HCP data sets because um, they're subject to NDA uh, DOAs. Uh, we've been in touch with the PIs of those studies and NIMH program about this. Uh, we don't think we're going to be able to put those on ND um, under the current DOA, uh, but we're going to put them on NDA and uh, community collection, just like Damien Fair has done with like kind of his pre-processed ABCD yeah. stuff. And you'll have to get a DUA, but it'll at least like there'll be a, you know, it, like it, it'll be a, it'll be a, like an, a different DUA, but I, I don't, we don't see an administrative way around that right now. It may change in the, in the future though, because I know um, NDA DUAs are a work in progress, even if it's a bit slow moving. Great. So again, so as long as you have the appropriate authorization for those various sources you, you know, 
will have a way into to that pathway, I guess, is the point there. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, okay. they, they, we don't want to make anything where it's just, just us using it. Yeah. I see questions. Uh, Sebastian's first on my screen, so I'll call on him. And muting of some sort. It doesn't say it's muted on Zoom, but we're not hearing you. OK, how about Yarek and you'll? <laughs> um, yeah. Motion. <laughs> so you spend lots of time on um, point that the motion is bad, right? And we need to deal with it, account for it, filter for it, whatever. I wonder how could we, did you research into what factors contribute to amount of motion, even within the same age, right? And how we could prevent it? Yes, because no. my hypothesis and what we do, well, we kind of do not yet, but let's say um, humidity of the air, right? My, my wild hypothesis, humidity might matter, right? Because let's say you it's dry air in the scanner, coldness or temperature and humidity. Would they be factors on the amount of motion? Did you did anybody look into that? I uh, it's a great question, Yark. Uh, so my my null is that almost any individual difference that you care about will be related to motion. <laughs> um, and whether it's, uh, I think that, you know, humidity, like actually I've, I've usually thought of person level factors like um, cognition, psychopathology, BMI, medication, this sort of stuff. But I think you're actually bringing up an important question which is sight level factors. Um, and I, you know, we, we do see this uh, in some of the multi-site studies that have systematically different motion. And it's, it's hard to tell whether it's just because you're sampling for a different population or they have different equipment. Maybe the room is more humid or maybe uh, the head coil is less comfortable or maybe the tech is less nice. Um, <laughs> and it's like there, but I, I think that site level differences in data quality are, are a huge deal. Um, and uh, one of the nice things that we're starting to, we, I don't have a slide on this yet because it's like, I just saw the data a couple of weeks ago, but there are systematic differences both across sites and then within sites in terms of heterogeneity of the data um, based on like, if you look at uh, when you parse the data with qubits and you see like, oh, these a slightly different sequence here. And like, it's like, things are, things are different and it affects your analyses. The QA can be different. The measurement can be different. And so I think that you really can't be too careful. Um, but in the end, what are, like, like there, it's probably, there's a lot of different factors that determine data quality, but in the, in the end, to try to have some sort of summary measure that you can uh, like interrogate and control for is, is useful. What that summary measure should be is certainly a work in progress. But also just having record of what those measures were, so they could be used maybe at the higher level analysis of, to explain the variance, which otherwise you can, you know, yeah. Off, right? Well, and, 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 and not yeah, explain that variance because otherwise, since it's correlated with the thing you care about, you'll come to a conclusion that, uh, you know, it's a cog cognitive effect, but it actually is just kids who with poor cognition tend to move more in the scanner. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Uh, Seb, want to try this again? See how we're doing? Yeah, it's still no voice. It could be typed in the chat. Uh, yeah, I can narrate uh, it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Other folks with questions while we try to figure out either Seb's thing? Um, so you, let me see if I can remember. It was back in the beginning of the session. Uh, you were talking about instead of FA, uh, there was sort of better measures you know, that might be less sensitive to motion and more sensitive to I can follow, I can follow this slide. Perfect. Um, that went by a little bit quick. And so I just wanted to hear sort of that sentence one more time yeah. uh, and think about, you know, when it's great when you have, you know, sort of HCP style acquisitions with multi shells and all that kind of stuff. If one, you know, doesn't do fancy multi-shelled acquisitions, are they hosed and you know things like that. Yeah, exactly. Follow up on that. David, you're the first person to tell me I talk too fast. <laughs> it wasn't too fast. I couldn't listen fast enough. No, it's it's definitely a, it's a recurrent theme. Um, so uh, yeah, so with multi, if you have multi-shell data and like whether it's HCP or ABC, most of these large uh, data sets now are acquiring multiple shells. 
What we found is that the MAPL model, where for which uh, uh, gives you things like RTOP and RTAP, that's the return to origin probability and the return to uh, angle probability and RTPP, which is return to plane probability. These measures are highly sensitive to age, especially the simplest, which is return to origin that just general measures general water constraint. Um, and the like with the effect size, this is a small data set. This is only a multi-shell data set we collected here at Penn and around 200 participants. Uh, there, uh, and then also uh, the MAPL model isn't widely used, but the NADI model is widely used. And ICVF um, is uh, kind of one of the most common measures that's the intracellular volume fraction. That is also very sensitive to age. And both these measures are not very sensitive uh, to motion. In contrast, you look at something like FA, uh, and it's much less sensitive to age and much more sensitive to motion. Uh, probably because it's a fraction and it's like unstable, uh, but it's uh, it kind of suggests that if you have multi-shell data, you should fit uh, a multi-shell model to get not just something like multi-shell FA, which you can get, but something like ICBF or RTOP. Uh, subsequently, this unpublished, which subsequently we've replicated these results in the Healthy Brain Network, which has like a multi-shell DKI scan. It's not exactly the same ordering, but the overall picture is very, very similar. Okay, cool. Thank you. I see a hand in Yarek and my Andy appeared. So it's maybe he's Yarek and then Andy. Um, since you are so much into bits, I, I wonder, and all of this, MRS, did you look into MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy? I, at all? I, I have done absolutely zero MRS in my whole life. Okay. I'm uh, just checking, just checking, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think there is a bid spec for MRS, right? There is BEP uh, 22 enhancement proposal, that's one. But second, motion. I wonder how motion, because you, you're focusing yourself on that little thing, right? And would motion then just to introduce noise? I remember they sample a lot, right? So is there kind of perspective motion assessment which you then regress out from these, you know, jittery samples? I don't know. That's why I was curious. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about the MRS field, but I'd be... Uh extremely surprised if it wasn't a major, major issue, um, especially for single voxel uh, spectroscopy. Um, Cause also you're gonna get all sorts of, like you're gonna measure different parts of the brain, you're getting partial volume and you get blurring. I don't know how it affects the different parts of the spectra. And like, so, but uh, I think it's, I, I'm concerned along with you, but don't have any data for you. Okay. Right. Often just to throw in before I try Seb again, uh, often the voxels in single voxel spectroscopy are kind of biggish. And you're gonna throw a big voxel across, you know, the uh, anterior, anterior insula or something like that. So yes, you can have movement, but that may be, you know, sort of small part of that volume is moving around. So who knows, it's an open question, but there may be some less sensitivity in some ways since the oh, voxels are yeah. kind of big so can handle a little bit more movement, but anyway. Uh, so Seb, let's try again. Okay, last try. Does this work? You got it. Yay. Yay, great. Well, thanks so much for the talk. I, I wanted to ask about your last slide, uh, the data availability. Um, so I wasn't aware of the RDC. I think that's a bank in Canada as well. Um, but it sounds really cool. Uh, and what I was particularly interested in is what you said, the harmonization on the clinical side, because uh, I guess, as we all know, BIDS does everything great that comes off the scanner, but that part is not well spec. And um, so we're working on something that would allow us to define cores at the sample level in a, in a Parkinson direction, but we want to get the data from different places. And it sounds like what you're doing is make one big place where all the data follow a certain specification. So I'm really interested in how you're, how you're yeah. doing the harmonization step. Well, so first, I, I am really glad you flagged that because uh... I mean, the clinical harmonization in some ways is harder than the imaging harmonization. <laughs> like it's just the profusion of scales and measurements and lack of mapping between them is just, it's tough. Um, so that part of the effort's being led by Giovanni Saloum, who is uh, at Child Mind Institute and in Brazil at uh, Porto Alegre. He's amazing psychiatrist slash psychometrician. And uh, there's not infrastructure for it. It's like, we're putting it in bids. It's just like a, kind of using the standard gen generic demographic spec, but Really, he's using before it gets to that step. It's 
he's using item response theory to try to create mappings between different instruments. We're focused on what's called a bifactor model of psychopathology, which is an overall measure of psychopathology, and then sub factors related to things like depression, anxious misery, you know, externalizing things. And so, and uh, there's been a couple of papers that have come out now. If you follow up with me, I can send them to you from Giovanni's group about that process and how it's gone. They're amazing, um, but it's in some ways it's harder. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree with you. But it, and it's, it seems like I don't think I'm not sure there's a general solution across different subfields. Like I don't I'm, I'm I'm not confident that what we've learned for RBC would apply to Parkinson's, depending on the structure of the data and whether you have mappings between the measures. But it, it sounds like you're going at this from kind of the domain knowledge side of the world, where you say that okay, there's certain um, conceptual correspondences between these things. Yeah. rather than map everything into these controlled buckets that, that already exist, for example, or? Well, or, it, it, I mean, it's kind, kind of both. Um, like a lot of the, uh, the like a lot, like kind of the CBCL um, is like the instrument that is most common across the data set. So some of the mapping goes through that. Uh, but some of the studies, like for example, our study, we acquired this idiosyncratic uh, instrument, uh, which we had a Thomas, you know, that one, there's not a clear mapping between it. So like we like that, there's a whole paper that we're just about to submit about like, see if like what sort of harmonizations can we do? And not, it, we, we can't really answer the question, but we can answer the question is like, do we get the same factor structure in psychopathology? If we feel like, like psychopathology should have the same kind of structure, regardless of whether you're in New York or Philadelphia, then like, can we find items that allow us to recover that structure across different samples? Yeah, thanks. That's super interesting. I'm, I'm definitely gonna follow up. Okay, yeah, please do. Giovanni is the best. Yeah, very exciting topic. And uh, again, as you already said, you know, in the psychopathology side, the CBCL and you know, a number of these things are very common, but yet not well mapped across efforts. And so that's very important work. I see Andy has, un has turned his video on. Is that because he has a question or does he just want to say hello? Hello, uh, no, question also. Uh, thanks, great talk, it's always, Good to follow what you guys are doing. Uh, we need. Oh, I should turn. I should fly my colors. I guess here. We there need we to go. keep up with you. Um, so I was looking. I googled model array uh, as you were talking about. I didn't find anything. Is it not um, out there published yet? Or inference should be out. Uh, we're hoping by OHVM, but not not quite yet. But okay. that could be. I mean, that could be a flywheel gear for sure, Andy. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I. I I don't know whether do you do you have any sense of whether people at other with other instances use WoodyConf or not? I mean, people use it a ton. I don't know if it's got an uptake elsewhere. No, not really, um, because it's so different, uh, and and we have our own way. And so, and it turns out I'm the person who's in, responsible for that. And the the people who developed it kind of threw it over the fence and said, "Here, you scientific solution engineers, you take this now." And, and they, they oh. called it abandonware, but they already had this interesting template way of processing bids. So it's it's a bit different than WoodyConf, but we. I keep going to the ReproM site and digging through that code. Thank you, Yarek. Are you still here? Yes, uh, for that to see how things should be done, uh, and we're, we're we're just trying to keep up. Uh, but yeah, no, um, I, I think so. Uh, as I said earlier, main, maintaining the software as students leave is always the hardest part, and so that's our job. And so, if you want to, if you want to take over Foodicom and charge people for it, I'd be actually be psyched because at least someone would be using it. <laughs> I'm, so, uh, yeah, I'm always happy to talk more. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at some of the other things to, to like because Flywheel does things differently. That we don't store data in a data structure; it's in a database. So it's a little bit hard to use some of the standard uh, bids tools for you know putting it in bids format. Like qubits, I think I, I can't really use that. Yeah. I can't make that into a gear, but I could steal all the great ideas. <laughs> yeah, no, please take it. It's, that is, uh, you know, we're totally okay with people forking things and moving to moving them in a different direction. Yeah, and if you've got, uh, well, we're just working on QSI prep right now, uh, a new version of that to release. Awesome. Uh, a gear anyways. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, I came to this talk to, to see what more I should fo follow and, and put in, make into gears as we go along. That would be awesome. I think that like the process of wrapping gears is uh, we don't have the staffing for it anymore. And so uh, if you guys do it, then we'd be very psyched. Yeah. Great. Thanks for uh, joining us, Andy, and good to see you. It's been a while. Any other questions out there in radio listening land?
If we don't hear any now, uh, we know how to get to Ted. Uh, he's not hard to find. And uh, again, they're a very collaborative group and it's uh, great to uh, work with them. And he is uh, amongst one of the, um, the collaborative projects of Vrepernim Center itself. So uh, we all get credit when we work together on important things. So that is great.